Thank you for joining. Today we are going to cover two products. Power Automate, which was earlier called Flow and Power Apps. This is a quick introduction. As you know, we are covering the entire Office 365 platform from a user point of view. If you have any questions, please post them using this icon on the top and mention the slide number if required. The platform has many products. We have covered almost all of them except for three, and today we are going to cover Power Automate and Power Apps. Power BI, we will cover tomorrow. So now, why are we covering these products as a pair? Because they come under something called Power Platform. Power Automate is used for automating workflows, automating repetitive processes. And Power Apps is a quick way of creating business apps without programming. Both of these are designed to work on browser, but they also have their respective mobile apps. Coming to Power Automate, if you typically look at any kind of automation, the first thought which comes to mind is, oh, I have to have someone from IT or some programmer involved, and that is not required here. You can automate simplistic but repetitive manual work yourself as a user. What happens is IT or programming requires a more serious use case or scenario, a more complex kind of automation, which has probably already happened. But there are a lot of repetitive activities which go on, which nobody is looking at from an automation point of view. That is where Power Automate comes into picture. So in simple terms, what is automation? In the context of Power Automate, look at it like Outlook rule. I am sure you have created some Outlook rules in past. What happens there? You say a mail comes from someone, move it to another folder. That's a rule. That's sort of automation within Outlook. So the mail arriving is the trigger and moving it to another folder is the action. In the same way, Power Automate also works on trigger and actions. For every workflow or every automation, there can be only one trigger, but multiple actions. What kind of triggers? Different types of triggers. For example, as I said, when a mail arrives, you want to look, is this mail related to this particular project? If yes, second thing you want to check is, does it have an attachment? If yes, then you want the attachment to be saved automatically into OneDrive. This is a simple description of a automation requirement. Now, Power Automate doesn't just work with Office 365 products. It also works with lots of third party products. For example, you have a hashtag which you are monitoring and you want to see any new tweet coming. You don't want to manually keep track of it. So as soon as a tweet comes, it should be a new entry added into Excel without anybody monitoring Twitter. That is also possible. Similarly, like we saw yesterday, we use forms to create feedback forms or surveys. When a feedback is submitted, you want to look at the score, and if it is poor, you want to send an apology mail. If customer appreciates your work or service, then you want to send a thank you mail, another requirement. Just give me a second. So what kind of triggers can be there? As we have seen, everything in Office 365 can potentially trigger a workflow. So some products like PowerPoint don't have, maybe in future they will have, but most of the products can trigger a workflow. We will see some examples as we go along. 
one of the commonest places for business automation is a SharePoint list. You put an entry in a SharePoint list, that's a trigger and that creates a workflow which is probably for approval or something else. Actions can also be in various tools. For example, all these products have actions. Some products have triggers as well as actions. Now this is not limited to Office 365. We have lots of third party applications. In fact, the list keeps on growing every week and now it has reached, I think 250 plus third party applications where you can integrate them with Power Automate. Now when you say automate, what do we mean? Like I said, when something happens, I want some actions to happen. That's called an automatic type of flow. Where once you define it, you don't have to worry about it. It keeps running till you stop it. You define when it invokes itself and what it does and that's it. The other one is on demand. That means you as a human being invoke it. It just creates a button. You can give a custom name to the button and press the button and then it will do whatever actions you have asked it to. So you pressing the button itself is the trigger. There is another type which I have not mentioned here where there is nobody to trigger the button, but it is triggered by time. So maybe 830 in the morning you want it to go to an Excel sheet. Look at what actions are to be done by home. Check is there an action pending? Check uh, is it within one week and then send a reminder something like that. Then of course we have approvals. Approvals can be serial and parallel. That means there are three approvers. Person A approves, then goes to B, then goes to C. That's serial. Parallel means it is sent to all three together and any two of them or three of them can approve all kinds of combinations. And then there are more sophisticated business processes where you define the steps specifically. Never mind. So let's see a particular flow. This is already designed, but this will give you an idea of how it looks in real life. So the first thing you see here is the trigger. What does this mean? I have created a form called capture feedback. So the trigger is forms when a new form is submitted in this particular particular form called capture feedback. Now for each form submitted, this is important because multiple people are going to submit the form. We want the same actions to happen for each one of them. Then what do you do? You get the response, then check the response. All the questions we have asked will be there and then you check is that score below a particular value? If it is below, that means poor response. Then if yes means is score below three, yes or no. If it is yes, send an apology mail. If no, then it's good feedback, so send a mail. Of course, there can be more steps below each one of them. So this is how you design a flow by adding trigger first and then adding one or more steps. In this short period of time, we don't have time to go through the steps, but you get the idea. Now, this Power Automate is a new kind of product. We have not been exposed to something similar before. That's why it is important to learn it. There are very simple ways of learning it. You already have a lot of templates. You can use them, you can explore them, and there is a lot of training content in the Flow website itself very structured learning with hands on and with samples. Just coming to templates, there are hundreds of ready made templates which people have created, not just Microsoft, but even users can create and upload. And if Microsoft approves, they will also be listed. The best way to learn this is to start from a template. For example, here, whenever a special customer or important customer sends you a mail, you should get a push notification on your mobile. So this is the trigger and action. You click on the workflow and then it will tell you this is a ready made one. You just have to configure which email ID and what is the email ID of your VIP customer and then it starts running. That's how it is. There is another new thing which has been added recently called UI flows. This is for legacy integration. It's traditionally called RPA or robotic process automation. I won't go into details of this, but in case you don't know, Flow or Power Automate does have desktop based or web based screen scraping and related workflows. 
Now, when you create flows, there are some best practices to follow. First of all, every step gets a generic name. You rename it so that you remember next time what we were intending to do in that particular step. Otherwise, it becomes confusing. There can be a comment also, and you should add a comment for every step explaining in detail because you may forget or your team members may have to handle it later. So good to document. There is no auto save because all this is browser based, so save often. Otherwise, this can be a very complex flow and you will miss it. Something crashes because this is browser based. Bandwidth is fluctuating. You may lose your work. The other thing is when you create a flow, only you can manage it. The first thing you should do for real life flows is to share it with someone else. So if you leave the company or you're on leave, someone can manage it. And very important when you're learning the flows when they're running, they keep running lifelong. So if you're testing something, if you're learning something, as soon as you finish it, deactivate it. Otherwise, some random flows are running and they may interfere with real flows and give you wrong output. So those are the best practices. Now let's come to Power Apps. Power Apps is creating mobile apps. It can be mobile app as in designed for mobile form factor, or it can also be for a tablet, which basically means for a PC or a horizontal form factor. Mobile form factor works only on mobiles, whereas horizontal is more designed for desktop or tablet apps. So how do we go about doing it? This is zero programming. There is some functionality and there is some kind of customization and complexity, but instead of writing commands, they are designed like Excel functions, so they are easier to learn for a user. The idea is when you create an app in Power App, there is no compilation. You just say publish and it gets deployed. Where do people use the app? Either on browser or on mobile phone. On mobile phone, there is an app called Power App and all the applications you have developed will be visible in that user interface. And once you change some functionality, you say publish again, the app gets updated. It's very simple, very effective and very fast. There are three types of apps. Uh, Canvas app means the simplest one. You start with some data source or you can start from scratch and build it. Model driven is more sophisticated because somewhere you have to keep the data. You can start with data in simple Excel also, but in the long run, this is enterprise data, so it's better kept in some kind of more structured storage. So if you keep it in what is called as common data services, then that kind of app is called a model driven app. And then there is a third one which I'm not going to discuss, which is more a part of Dynamics set of products. So when it comes to Canvas apps, these are very simple to create freestyle. You can customize every aspect of it and you can have all kinds of controls in them. So you start with data. Use some relationships. There are multiple data points and automate your business process by creating custom forms like this. Now, what can be data sources? Of course, within Office 365, we have SharePoint, Excel Online, SQL Server and common data services. But again, like Power App or Power Automate, there are third party data sources which are supported, a lot of them. So you start with the data and you create a app design like this. Each one of them are UI controls. So this is a caption control. This is a list control. There's a filter control. There's a plus sign which invokes another form to add a new entry, those kind of things. So these controls can be added. A lot of very comprehensive list of controls is available. It also has very good media controls because most of these apps run on devices like mobile phones. So it understands cameras, barcode scanning, GPS coordinates and all such stuff. So you design the app like this. So the life cycle is like this. You start with the data which we and then design the user interface. Test it, then publish it and share it with people and people start using it. It can be a very short cycle of conceptualization to actual usage. So here is a very, very quick example. This is simple data. I want to capture name of people, email ID, height, preference one means wedge, two means non-wedge, and shirt size. 
Now different shirt sizes. I want to create a separate master list, so I have another table in Excel, which is just the list of possible shirt sizes. This Excel is stored in OneDrive. Using this within few minutes, you can create this nice little thing which will run on a mobile and people can capture. You can enter the data when you click register. There will be a row added here. This part is used to populate this drop down. Without any programming, that's the key part of this. As though this is not enough. Now Microsoft has added AI also or artificial intelligence also or machine learning as a part of this. So even if you don't understand AI programming, you don't understand how to train an AI model, you can still utilize it. For example, a most powerful one from a demo perspective is an object detection where you have, let's say, different kinds of spare parts and you have an image library. You take some time, make a library of images and teach this thing. This means nut, this means bolt, that means screwdriver like that. And then once it is trained, then it can capture an image on mobile and classify the objects. So it's very, very quick and without knowing programming, without being a data scientist, you can actually start utilizing AI in the process. So next. Again, Power Automate is a completely different thing because as a user, we are not used to any kind of user interface creation or app creation. You may have done a little bit of uh, macros in Excel, but this is different. So it's very important to go to guided learning. There is a nice small little course which will start you from scratch and give you a ready-made application with detailed steps and samples. Do that and there are more courses if you are further interested and then you can be up and running very quickly. Finally, Power Automate and Power Apps are designed to work together. I don't have time to tell you the details, but for example, when you submit a form in Power Automate, uh, Power Apps, I mean, when you submit a request for an item, Power Automate can start the workflow and get the approvals done and vice versa. So that is about the integration part. So that's all we have time for for these two products today. I know it was a very quick introduction and I strongly suggest if you like the concept and if you feel it is useful to you in your day to day life, then you must go through that training and then you can be up and running in as little as one day. So that's it for now. If there are any questions, I will take questions now. OK, the question is from Janaka. Can we use power automation to generate SMS alerts for or email for a person? Email, yes. There's something called push notification, yes. But if you want to generate SMS, then you will have to have a third party service which delivers SMS messages. Because in the context of Office 365, you can't send SMS message unless you have a provider for it. OK, so. Tomorrow we are going to cover Power BI. Today was Power Automate and Power Apps. Tomorrow Power BI and the last one is project. As you know, all these videos will be available. On this playlist on my efficiency 365 channel in YouTube. All the previous videos already available and this will be available very soon. Con power or can power automate output be used in PowerPoint presentation as live item? No, I, there is no integration like that, but with programming you can do that. Can you please roll out the session one more time briefly? I don't understand what that means. OK, we have another question.
Yeah, so it's a long question, but essentially it means what is the governance which is required to enable people to use it. So first of all, you should not open it out to everyone, but probably in every department there are some champions or power users who are more savvy. They may not be programmers, but they learn fast and they're interested in furthering efficiency. Those are the kind of people you should do it, but you can't just identify the people and say, OK, now you have these two products available. Use them. It's a good idea to do a training for them. IT can learn it first and then do an internal training and then take a use case which is relevant to the company and build it together. Then second step, let them build another use case under your supervision and by that time you get the desired level of maturity and then things will work. It won't happen overnight, but without programming, it has huge amount of integration potential, so it's worth exploring. What is the best approach to launch this for a large organization which has 60,000 users? As I said, you start small with a team of around 10 people, probably from one or two departments, gain knowledge from it, create some internal best practices, and then roll it out to or open it out to potential champions across departments or locations. All right, so if no more questions, then thanks for joining. As I said, the video will be available very soon at this playlist, and there is already a long playlist of all the past videos. So that's it for now. Thank you all for joining. Take care.